Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Container Gardening. Uh, my name is Melissa Almendinger. I work at Duke Farms. I'm the coordinator of our community garden. Um, our garden is closed right now, as is all of Duke Farms. Um, and so we've transitioned our educational programming to this sort of virtual format, which we're getting used to is a little bit odd. Um, we're used to teaching in a very interactive, hands-on way. Um, but this is a fun way that we can still interact with people. Um, in fact, we're interacting at this point with many more people than we normally do. So um, it's a great opportunity for us. And thank you all for joining. I see people are still sort of wandering into our meeting right now. So I'm going to give you a little bit of logistics um, for managing this Zoom call in case you've not been on one before. Um, that way you get the, the best uh, experience that you can get. So what we'd like you to do is to keep your screen in the upper right hand corner, you should have an option um, between gallery and speaker mode. We want you to keep your screen on speaker mode. And what that does is it changes your screen so you see only the very largest picture of the person that is talking. Um, so that way you're not seeing like a thousand teeny tiny little boxes. Um, so keep that on speaker mode. You do have the option um, on the bottom of your screen in Zoom, there is a chat option. Um, you can ask questions through there. There is also an option to raise your hand. Please don't do that because we will not see you because there are so many people in this program. Uh, we, we, it would be impossible to, uh, for us to see um, who is raising their hand. I'm getting some comments that there's no audio for someone. I hope that you guys are all hearing me. Jeff, are you hearing me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. I'm not sure what the problem is. It must be a problem on their personal computer. Maybe try raising up your volume if you can't hear me. Um, anyway, sorry about that. So do not raise your hand. If you have a question, simply click on the chat option at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in your question. Make sure you're typing it to everyone um, and not somebody's name. Uh, it should be the default setting for everyone. That way we can see your questions come in and we can answer them. Probably what we'll do is we will stop halfway through the program, answer a few questions, um, and then at the end address a few more. Um, if we run out of time, we can save all of those questions. Actually, we will save all those questions. Um, we will type all the answers and then email them out to you um, you know, later today or tomorrow so that you have all the answers you're looking for. So don't worry about that. Um, the other thing you'll get is um, a few links. So our speaker today is going to be referencing a few links on container gardening, and we're going to send you um, the sources for those links so you can follow up on your own, print them out if you like, or just read um, some of those references. Um, I think that's it for keep, oh, keep yourself muted, keep your video off. That'll help your internet um, work a little bit more quickly when you're listening to the presentation. So we asked that, and that also it would be, it's a little bit disrupting when people um, have their video going. Um, so that's that. Let me tell you a little bit about the program you're about to hear. Um, so as I said, I work in the community garden at Duke Farms. Um, it's a five acre community garden. Uh, we have over 400 participants um, that come and garden with us every year. So given that the um, garden is closed right now, um, we are, we've gotten a lot of requests for how do I start container gardening? You know, people have yards, they may have not the ability to dig a new garden bed this year, but they want to try out container gardening. Container gardening is actually quite different from gardening in the ground. Um, and we wanted to have this program so that we could address some of the similarities, but then the various differences that there are and give you some tips and tricks to help make your container gardening season successful. Uh, we're so excited that people are showing more of an interest in gardening. We're not sure if it's, you know, there's food security, there's question of, you know, maybe I don't want to go to the grocery store. Um, and getting into gardening is a great way to, you know, produce some of your own food. It's great exercise great family time, um, all of that sort of stuff. So we're so happy to have you here. Our presenter today is Linda Lewis. So Linda is a lifelong gardener. She is somewhat of an expert on container gardening. Um, she is actually a new member of our community garden. She hasn't even been to the community garden yet because uh, it hasn't opened yet this season. 
Um, but she's a, she was going to do this program in person in the garden, um, and she's agreed to do it virtually in this capacity so that um, we could still share the information and get it out to everybody. So I am going to, I see a question about sending out the video. Yes, we'll send um, the video out to everybody as well as all the links. So you'll have that information. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the program over to Linda. I'm going to mute myself um, and turn Linda on. And then, um, like I said, everybody keep your, your uh, video on speaker mode. You'll see her nice and big. You'll be able to hear her hopefully nice and clearly um, and type your questions in the chat. So with that, I will go ahead and mute my... Good morning. Um, it's really lovely to be here. It's amazing to see so many people tuned in for this. This is a very new experience for me. Uh, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. I have done lots of presenting in person, but sitting here in my living room talking to a screen is new for me. So we'll see how this works. <coughs> We're going to talk today about growing vegetables in containers. Excuse me. <coughs> Never fails. I have, there are three references that I primarily took the information which I'm going to share with you from. And I'd like to show them to you just so that when you see them, you, you take the, the links that we're going to send you and see them, you'll recognize them. The first is a fact sheet from Rutgers University called Container Gardening with Vegetables. This is what the front of it looks like. You're going to see it, you might see it backwards. But in any case, this is a brief document. It has a lot of comprehensive information in it, but it is not nearly as detailed. And someone who is more familiar with vegetable gardening might be might have an easier time with this than someone who is new to, to vegetable gardening altogether. The second ref, um, reference I want to show you is from the University of Maryland. This is container vegetable gardening, healthy harvests from small spaces. Just so you have a sense of what it looks like when you see it. This is a much longer document. It has a lot more detailed information about the topics that we are going to discuss only uh, briefly today. So it's a good source, even if you are, you know, especially if you are not an experienced gardener, it's also a very good source if you are, because it highlights the differences between growing in the ground and growing in a pot. The third source that's important for today's presentation, I will talk about later when I talk about uh, pots and the plants, the specific plants that you can put in each kind of pot. We talked, Melissa mentioned a little bit about why you'd want to do container gardening. Um, I'm sure not being able to get into your own garden never occurred to anybody as a reason, but there are a lot of reasons, especially if you um, have limited mobility or limited physical strength. Um, putting plants in containers can make them easier to access and easier to work with. It's less strenuous. You can control the scope of your garden very easily that way so you don't commit yourself to too much um, activity. It's also a good way, even if you are an in-ground gardener, to keep plants that you use most often close to your kitchen, um, such as herbs or the cherry tomatoes that you like to pick all the time. So for whatever reason, if you'd like to try this, it, it is possible to get a good crop out of a container. Some of the issues in growing in containers versus growing in a pot, it, uh, excuse me, in the ground are the same. And the first issue that is the same is light. All of the energy that a plant gathers from to make a crop for you has to come from sunlight. And without a minimum amount of energy entering the plant, you don't get a crop. So if you have four hours of direct sunlight, that is sunlight that is unimpeded by any shadowing. In four hours a day, you can grow leafy green vegetables such as spinach, lettuces, kales, Asian grains. You can also be successful with scallions and parsley and smaller varieties of cabbages. The reason you can get away with only four hours of flight a day to grow leafy vegetables is that the part of the vegetable you're eating is just a leaf. It doesn't take as long 
or as much energy for the plant to create a leaf you can eat than it does to create, say, a root or a fruit. So if you have reasonable, if you have four hours of light, you can grow what I would call a salad garden. I have done this successfully uh, on my deck rail in my backyard under an oak tree. It gets morning sun from the time the sun comes up until about 11 in the morning and I get a good crop of lettuces from that. If you have four to six hours of sun a day, and keep in mind this, the sunlight doesn't have to be continuous. That's the, if there are certain portions of the day during which your pot will be shadowed, it does not mean you cannot be successful as long as the total amount of time that the pot gets light is between four, is at least four and up to six hours, then you can grow broccolini, which is a hybrid of broccoli and other plants. You can grow root vegetables such as carrots, potatoes, radishes, beets, and turnips, and you can get a successful crop. Most of us are interested in what we call main season vegetables, the ones that we go to the store and buy all the time beans, tomatoes, eggplants, cucumbers, squash, peppers. You can grow these in containers and you can get a good crop out of them, but you need at least six to eight hours of light to get a minimal crop. The more sun these plants get, the more productive they will be. So if you can, you can give your tomato plant six hours of sun, but you're not going to get nearly as many tomatoes out of it as if that plant will get eight hours or 10 hours of sun. And the most productive sunlight for growing any plant hits the earth between 10 in the morning and four in the afternoon. That is when the sun is highest in the sky and the most energy is actually hitting the ground. So the more light you can give a plant between 10 in the morning and four in the afternoon, the better your productivity of your plant will be. The other issue you have to deal with, whether you have your plants in a pot or in the ground, is pests and diseases. A pest or a, an insect that will attack your bean plant in the ground will also attack your bean plant in a pot. And any pathogens that make that attack your plant will also attack your plant in a pot. The solution for this is to check your plants weekly. When you go out and water, Take a look at the plants in detail. Turn the leaves upside down and look at the undersides. A lot of pests and diseases are evident from the underside of the leaf, but not the top. Look for signs of being, look at the leaves for signs that they have been eaten by something. Look for discolorations or colors that shouldn't be there on the leaf. And look for misshapen leaves as well. There are some uh, pests that will actually create structures on the bottom of the leaf that actually cause it to shrivel. If you find something that is a problem with your plant, I would normally tell you to call the Master Gardener hotline, helpline I should say, and get some assistance from them. Unfortunately, the helpline isn't functioning right now. So your best next, next best bet is to look online. And the easiest way to find the information that you're looking for is to ask the question as though you were talking to a person. Say, why are there white spots? Type into the computer, why are there white spots on my tomato plants? And you'll probably get an answer that is right. Now, if you're not sure, when you look online, you're going to get answers from commercial vendors as well as from university sources. And the commercial vendors are obviously trying to sell you something. So you may wonder if you can trust the information. You're almost certainly with common vegetable problems, find more than one answer to your question. So compare the answers you get. If the information looks pretty, it looks consistent over several people so or several sources, you have a, a better, uh, you have a good, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a better chance that the information you're getting is accurate and will work. The advice you're getting will work. That, that's where the similarities are. Now we're going to get into the differences, and they are significant. If you plant a standard tomato plant, say a Rutgers tomato, in the ground, that plant is going to create a root system that is capable of going down 
three to four feet in the ground, 36 to 48 inches straight down. It's also going to go out to the side, one to two feet. Now imagine a root system that big being packed into a container that's 12 inches around and 18 inches deep. It doesn't have the same space and it doesn't have the same resources and ability to seek out water, to seek out nutrients. What does that mean for the gardener? It means you have to work harder to support this plant in this limited space than you would have to when you're growing it in the ground. There are many different issues to talk about here. I'm going to talk about them one at a time in no particular order, and I'm going to start with soil. You may be thinking that you could go into your garden or you could go into your yard and dig up the soil that's there, amend it the same way you would amend the soil in your garden, put in a little fertilizer, put in a little um, compost, and you're good to go. And you can do that. That will work in a container. There are a couple of disadvantages to that though. One is clay soil is, ex we have clay soil in New Jersey and it is extremely heavy. If you fill a large pot with clay soil, it's going to be very difficult to move that pot if you need to do that. It's also going to be difficult when that plant gets dry to get it wet again because clay soil, as I'm sure you all know, turns into something more like a brick when it dries than real soil. The other problem is that if there are any pathogens, any disease causing agents in that soil, you're going to expose your plant to them. And you're also going, to, and if there are weed seeds in that soil, you're going to get weeds growing in your pot as well. Like I said, you can do this and it will work, but you're going to have a few more things to think about if you do use garden soil. What, what normally is recommended is that you use a, a synthetic or soilless mix. Now you can buy soilless mix in bags in stores or you can make it yourself. Either way, it's going to have the same four main ingredients. Soilless mix is composed of equal parts of peat moss and either perlite or vermiculite. That's where most of the bulk of soilless mix comes from. I'm gonna show you a couple of bags here. Peat moss you're familiar with. You can buy it in bales. You can use it the way it comes out of the bale. You can also buy milled peat moss, which is cut into smaller pieces. And that is the main reason why purchased soilless mix feels different from peat moss that you buy. Is that peat moss has been milled. It's been cut into small pieces. It makes it easier for it to get to absorb water. The, the role of the perlite or the vermiculite that you put in there is to keep those peat moss particles from clumping together tightly. In order for your plants to grow, whether they're in the ground or in a pot, you need to have air spaces in the soil. Air spaces create room for roots to grow. It creates um, a way for water and for air to get to the roots. You cannot keep roots wet constantly. They will rot. They need to be exposed to air as well. They need to dry out a little bit every once in a while. So you want spaces between the soil particles, in this case, peat moss, in your pot. Perlite looks like this. It's white particles. They're very light. They're a little bit larger. They're, they're probably a, a couple of centimeters in diameter. This is vermiculite. It's darker, the particles are smaller. As I said, the role of both of these materials in the pot is the same to create spaces for roots to grow. The only difference between the two functionally is that it does happen from time to time. That perlite being a little bit larger in particle size has more of a tendency to float to the top of your mixture as you water your plant. And you may find that by the end of the season, instead of being evenly distributed throughout your pot, the, the perlite has floated to the top third of the pot. It's not a deal breaker. But if you're not happy about that, then use the vermiculite. The vermiculite tends to stay where it belongs. So you're making soilless mix on your, you're buying a bag of soilless mix or you're making it on your own. You put equal parts of peat moss and vermiculite, let's say together. What are the other two ingredients? 
The third ingredient is garden lime. If you buy pre-made soilless mix, there's already lime in the bag. You do not need to add more. The reason for the lime is to raise the pH of the mixture to a range where it is compatible with the needs of plant roots. Plants like to grow, vegetable plants like to grow at a pH that is just slightly below neutral. The pH of peat moss tends to be more below neutral than the plants like. So you put the, peat, the garden lime in to raise the pH of the mixture. The last ingredient, which will be in the commercial mixture or you can put in yourself in your own, is slow release fertilizer. You can buy bags of slow release fertilizer in a nursery or a garden center or, or a big box store. It doesn't matter whether you get um, a, an organic version or an inorganic version is going to do the same job. It's what it, it is designed to do is get the plants started growing in your soil. It will not last, the amount that, of slow release fertilizer that is in the soil when you start growing is not going to last very long. You are going to have to fertilize these plants continuously through the season and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it gets everything started. So there's your, your standard recipe for homemade soilless mix. Two gallons of peat moss, two gallons of vermiculite, three quarters of a cup of garden lime, and slow release fertilizer as per the directions on the package. You can double that, triple that, have it any way you want. This, in the Rutgers uh, fact sheet that I referenced before, this is the recipe that you will get. Linda, can I um, interject just one moment? Yes. Um, so just to clarify, those four ingredients are what is normally found in a potting soil, correct? So you could buy the premix or you could purchase those four ingredients on your own. It's what's normally present in a soilless mix. Potting okay. soil may be just peat, mar peat moss and vermiculite, but there also may be topsoil in that as well. Okay, so if you have a potting soil that doesn't have fertilizer, you should add something in there, correct? Yes, and you can use potting soil. I saw that that question came up. You can use potting soil. The important thing to remember is that you want the pH of the mixture to be right, and you also want to start out with fertilizer in the pot. And should it be a general balanced fertilizer, NPK balanced? It can be a, it can be a standard, what's called a slow release or time release um, fertilizer, it's usually a powder or a pellet, and the package directions will tell you to put so much in per so many square feet of soil. If you're buying something specifically made for pots, it will tell you how much to put in per volume of the pot, for a gallon of, of the pot material, something like that. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. Continue. No problem. Um, okay, so we, you want to start with a soilless mix preferably because the plants will be better suited. The plants will grow better in it. It'll be lighter if you have to move the pot. Is there a difference between making your own and buying some? The only real difference is expense. If you don't have, if you're not planning on putting a lot of pots together, it may be worth it to just go buy the soilless mix, take the top off and dump it in the pot. You're ready to go. You don't have to do anything else. If you are planning to put a lot of pots together, then yes, soilless mix can get a little expensive. It's up to you, but it won't make any difference whether you make it yourself or you don't. Now, one more comment about soilless mixes. Some of them include water retentive polymer crystals or, or beads that you can put in. You can buy those separately if you want to put them in your own mix. It's perfectly okay. There'll be directions on the package for how much to use. If you have compost, either because you've bought some in the past or because you make it and you want to add pod, compost to your pot, absolutely. But keep in mind, compost is primarily a soil conditioner. It makes it easier, it creates spaces again for roots to grow. It does contribute a certain amount of what we call micronutrients, which are elements that plants use in very small amounts in order to set flowers and make fruits. Compost is not, however, a primary source of fertilizer. The nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer that you normally put on vegetables, compost does not 
contribute a huge amount of that. So don't count on compost as fertilizer. It does not work. Let's move on to watering. Containers dry quickly, much faster than soil in a garden will. On hot days, it is possible, depending on the size of the pot that you're using for your vegetables, that you will have to water three or four times a day in order to keep that pot from drying out. Clay soil holds water. If you're, if you're working in New Jersey soil in a garden, that soil is going to tend to stay wet and you don't have to think about, you know, you can go through a day or two of sunny weather and not have to think about checking whether the soil is still wet. A pot won't do that. A pot will dry out in the space of an afternoon. And this is probably the most demanding part of growing a plant in a container outside. You have to pay a lot of attention to how those plants are drying out. Can you do anything to make it a little easier to keep up with watering? Absolutely. One thing you can do is, is plant in self-watering containers. A self-watering container is essentially a large pot with a false bottom. The false bottom has holes in it. You put your soil in the pot, it, it settles on the false bottom. Between the false bottom and the bottom of the pot, there will either be a wick material or there will be holes to accommodate some of the roots getting down into the bottom of the pot. That bottom, underneath the false bottom, acts as a water reservoir. So when you water the plant, the water goes through the material and gathers below the roots in this reservoir at the bottom. That will not, now if you have a self-watering pot, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to go necessarily an entire day without watering. You may still have to water twice a day, but it will extend the period of time between waterings. If you don't have a self-watering pot or you don't want to spend money on one, you can kind of make one of your own by putting your regular pot into a tray and allowing the tray to fill up with water when you water the top of the pot and the water goes through. That works just fine, especially in, when you have stretches of hot weather to just use the tray as a reservoir. But the only downside to this is that when the weather turns wet, you need to take the tray away. You need to allow the, the pot to drain because Pots that sit in water will soak the roots in water and kill them. So just you just have to be aware from, a day, from day to day whether or not you need that tray underneath that pot and either leave it there or take it away. Now we're going to talk about nutrients. As I said before, whether you buy soil or make your own mixture for your pot, you're going to start with slow release fertilizer in the pot at planting. That will help the seedlings that you put in or the small immature plants that you put in to grow. But in addition to that, you're going to have to feed these plants every single week. They will not make it through a season on just what is in this pot, that, on just the fertilizer that's in the pot at the beginning of the season. According to the Rutgers fact sheet, the best, way to, the best way to fertilize is to use a water-soluble fertilizer, such as a 20-20-20, and apply it at the rate of a half tablespoon per gallon of water once each week. Now, what does that mean exactly? When we fertilize vegetable plants, we're giving them primarily nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Those are the three elements that a vegetable plant will consume the most of. What is it doing with that? What is it doing with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium? The nitrogen is a primary component of chlorophyll. The plant needs nitrogen to build chlorophyll molecules. Chlorophyll is what allows the plant to collect energy from the sun. If there's not enough chlorophyll, then you're not going to have enough energy in that plant to run its life processes, and it won't have the energy to produce the tomato you want to eat. Nitrogen is what the single element that your plant will consume the most of in the summer. The phosphorus and potassium have more to do, have a lot of roles in the plant, but they have more to do 
with setting a flower and setting a fruit. So in order to get the fruit off the plant, the plant has to flower and then the flower gets pollinated and it creates the fruit. Potassium and phosphorus facilitate that process. So if you don't have potassium and phosphorus, but you have nitrogen, you'll get a nice green leafy plant, but you won't get anything to eat off of it. And that's the whole point of growing it. Most, the numbers on the fertilizer package, the 202020, are telling you that 20% of the mixture by weight is nitrogen, 20% is phosphorus, and 20% is potassium. The rest of what's in the package is filler. If it's a solid, um, if it's a solid uh, fertilizer, then it's 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 uh, some kind of powdered uh, medium that will carry the the fertilizer. The rest of the package. If it's a liquid fertilizer, the rest of what's in the package is water. Um, roots, especially on new plants, are sensitive to fertilizers. They can be a little harsh on the roots. So usually, so you don't want to put a whole lot of fertilizer on a plant at any one time. You want to feed it continuously in small amounts that allow it to uptake what it needs, but won't what we call burn the roots. You're not, you cannot feed a plant in a pot in the same way that you feed a plant in the ground because the plant in the ground has more volume of soil to work with. The other issue is that heavy rains can deplete soil of fertilizer components even after you've just put them down. Research has shown that somebody who fertilizes a lawn, say, puts nitrogen fertilizer on their lawn to green, green it up. After one rainstorm, a lot of that nitrogen can be washed out of the soil because the nitrogen compound is so soluble in water, it has a tendency to just run away. The same thing happens when you water your pot with your tomato plant in it. You put nitrogen fertilizer in the soil, but when you run water through it, you're, you're washing some of that nitrogen fertilizer out of the soil. The directions that you get on the package account for that. But if you get a week where you get two heavy rainstorms outside and your pot has been sitting through them, you're probably washing, that storm has probably washed most of the nitrogen fertilizer you put in the pot out. The moral of this story is you get a week with heavy rainstorms, you're going to have to fertilize more because you're going to be washing nitrogen out of that soil. The potassium and phosphorus do not tend to be as affected by rain in that way, in that they don't normally wash out of the soil. The problem with, nit with potassium and phosphorus is that if the soil stays too wet and cold for a long period of time, that potassium and phosphorus in the soil is not going to be picked up by the plant because the conditions in the pot are not right for it. At, at the, by the same token, if this pot stays too dry for too long a time, it makes it difficult for the plant to pick up the nutrients that are actually there in the soil. So you have to be a little more attentive in extreme weather, long hot periods that are dry, long wet cooler periods, you might have to think about giving a little extra um, food to these plants to get them through. This can, the, the idea, these process of feeding your plants can get a little complicated and it can be daunting. Don't worry about it. The best thing you can do is start your plants with a slow-release fertilizer. Follow the directions that the Rutgers fact sheet will give you about maintaining your plants and over the course of time keep reading about fertilizing your plants. Learn a little bit more about it. It's not that hard to manage and you can get a feel for it fairly quickly. Don't expect, but don't expect you're going to just start um, immediately doing everything exactly right. You're not gonna kill anything, you'll be fine. Does anybody have anything they want me to talk about in addition about that right now? Um, I think we're good. So when, the question is, when should you first begin to add the water-soluble fertilizer after the slow-release fertilizer? The, the first time that the plant needs water. You have to, you should, let's, let's put it this way. You should be adding fertilizer once a week. 
If it's easier for you to say, okay, I'm home on Thursday mornings, so I'll put the fertilizer in the water on Thursday morning, then I do it on Thursday morning. Whatever schedule works for you. But the first week after you plant those plants, you're going to want to put more fertilizer in. Okay. And do you um, accommodate, like depending on the growth stage of the plant, does it change? Like if the tomato is fruiting or um, yes, so you know, the Rutgers fat time of yeah, harvest, the is there anything different? once a week yeah no the Rutgers fact sheet will tell you that when you start with younger plants the root systems are a little more sensitive they'll tell you to use half the amount of fertilizer that you will use later so you, you'll put like one half one half tablespoon of fertilizer in the water and use it until the plant is about half the size that you expect it to be when it's going to produce and from that point on for the rest of the season you double the amount, you'll put a tablespoon instead of a half tablespoon in the gallon of water. Perfect. Because setting flowers and making fruit takes more energy, the plant needs more food to accommodate that. That makes sense. Um, and then the last question, and I, I think you were, you were gonna talk about this anyway, was um, whether using organic fertilizer or synthetic, so a miracle Grow type of a fertilizer, is there a difference? Do you recommend one or the other? There is a difference in that if you want to maintain some kind of biome in the pot, if you use an inorganic fertilizer, you may not be able to achieve that. Functionally, no. You can grow just, you can grow the same, maybe just as successful using inorganic fertilizers as organic ones. If you're worried about what to do with the, with the soil in the pot at the end of the season, if you would normally compost it, or turn it into the soil in your garden in the ground, you can still do that either way because it's not a huge volume of soil. And the more time that soil spends in soil that has organic an organic biome in it, it will start to recover itself. So I don't think you can do any damage by incorporating soil that you've used in a pot into a composter or into the ground. Eventually it will correct itself. All right. Yes, thank you, Linda. Um, and I just noticed there's a there are a lot of questions about what to do. So, so fertilizing is different from plant to plant. Uh, it can be. Um, I would recommend that if you have if you're thinking of growing specific plants, that you do more reading about how to grow those specific plants in a pot. You can get you can you can read all summer about growing these plants in 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 pots. This is just an overview. So if you feel more comfortable learning more about the specific plants that you want to grow, by all means, there's plenty of information out there. Go for it. All right, at this point, I'm gonna talk about the, the plants themselves that you want to grow and the size of the pot that you should grow it in. I'm gonna start with maintenance. Uh, I noticed there's there have been a few questions if you know if I have some some pots in my garage can I clean them up and use them I have pots in my basement I have pots in my shed yes absolutely you can use them let's talk about what you need to do to get them in shape if they if you have pots in your basement like I do that have remains of prior use in them there's a little bit of soil in there there might be some mineral deposits in there how do you get them out it's not that hard the first thing you want to do is get all the debris out of the pot. If it's a clay pot, you can take steel wool or you can take a wire brush and just rub the pot on the inside until you get all of the old soil out. If there are mineral deposits, you can hit those as well and try to get as much of those out as possible. If you're using a ceramic pot, you can do something similar, but you have to be a little more careful depending on the material. You don't want to scratch it or break it. If you're working with plastic pots, plastic pots are easy to clean, um, easiest to clean, I should say, with uh, a Brillo pad or steel wool, something like that. Just rub everything inside until you get all the traces of soil or mineral deposits out. Sometimes mineral deposits can be really hard. You can use a knife carefully and scrape them off as well. Once you get all the debris out of your pot, you want to you want to get 
whatever pathogens might be in that pot, whatever disease agents might be there that would kill the new plant that you put in. To do this, you need to give the pots a bleach bath. This is the easiest way to do it. Take a garbage can, uh, a dish, depending on the size of the pots you want to clean, you can use a garbage can, you can use your sink, you can use, um, I use a, an old Rubbermaid storage container. I just put it on the floor in my basement fill it with nine parts water and one part bleach. Since I have, tend to have a lot of large pots, what I do is I put nine gallons of water in the pot, in the, in the container, and put one gallon of bleach in it. Mix it all together. It can be at room temperature. It doesn't have to be hot. And then you take the pots that you have scrubbed to get all the debris out and just put them in the bath for 10 to 15 minutes. What you're trying to do here is let the bleach, which is a disinfectant agent, kill any, any bacteria or viruses or whatever that are in there. If you have more pots to clean than actually fit in the bath at once, that's no problem. Give the first, put the first one in, the first batch in. When they've been in there 10 to 15 minutes, pull them out, rinse them off, put the next batch in, and keep doing that until you've cleaned or disinfected, I should say, every pot that you want to use. Once the pots have been disinfected, it's a good idea to go over them with detergent. Just wash them with dish detergent, run them through your dishwasher, just to get the bleach residue off of them. And it also gives you an opportunity to look one more time at your pots and make sure there isn't some mineral deposit on there that you want to get off or something that you missed before. Bleach also breaks down very rapidly in sunlight. So if you feel more comfortable, you can take your rinsed pots and just put them out in the sun for a couple of hours and let the sunlight uh, break down the bleach. And you're good to go. All the pots can be used then. You don't have to, if you store them and use them two months later, you don't have to clean them again. They should be fine. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is plants. All this information that you're going to read is going to say very optimistically, you can grow any plant you want in a pot. There should be an asterisk after that statement. Remember I mentioned before that a standard tomato plant root system will go down 36 to 48 inches into the ground. And you're trying to shove that root system at, into a pot that's maybe 18 inches deep, maybe 12 inches deep, and keep it alive. It's going to take a lot more work to do that. And the truth is, you will be much more successful growing vegetables in pots if you choose smaller varieties of the vegetables. If you want to grow successfully, if you want to successfully grow a standard tomato, you can put it in a 12 inch pot. I have done this myself. And at the end of the season, I got four tomatoes off that plant. If you want more tomatoes, you have to give the root system more room. So if you choose a plant that has a smaller root system, you're going to get more produce from your plant. Now, I mentioned earlier, that there was one more source I wanted you to look at. There is an article online at a uh, website by growjourney.com. The name of the website is growjourney.com, G-R-O-W-J-O-U-R-N-E-Y.com. This is a commercial site, but the article I'm referring to is entitled Pot Sizes Decoded. And it's result of research done by a master gardener who discovered to her chagrin that there is no standard pot size in the nursery industry. She collected a bunch of what are supposed to be five gallon pots and actually did the math to measure the capacity of those pots and found that they varied from between three and a half gallons to six gallons, depending on the manufacturer, because there is no standard size. So she, she did this research, she published this article, and the, the highlight of the article, aside from the ducks who are very entertaining, we look at the article, you'll know what I mean, is a nine page chart. The chart gives you the approximate true value, true volume of a variety of pots 
the corresponding size of the pot in terms of diameter and depth. So you'll know that the pot that is so wide and so deep has a volume of this. And then she'll also tell, she also tells you what are, what are the plants that are appropriate to grow in that size pot. She, the first pot she considers is a half pint in volume. The biggest one is about 100 gallons. It's a very comprehensive um, chart. And I think it's the first thing you should look at when you decide to buy plants and put them in these pots is find out what size plant or what, what variety of plant will work best in what size pot. She also will tell you as a general rule that she recommends that what she's recommending here are absolute minimum sizes that if you can go up a size or two um, in with your pot size you're going to get an even better result. So these are minimums but it's a good starting place for you to figure out what you can get in your five gallon container that actually has a capacity of four and a half gallons. So I strongly recommend you take a look at this. There are two ways to look at pot size with respect to what plant can I put in that pot. The one way is the volume, which we just talked about. Um, and in general, you will be told that a one to three gallon pot will accommodate most herbs, green onions, radishes, chard, peppers, dwarf tomatoes, or cucumbers. And a four to five gallon pot Will, uh, will accommodate a full-size tomato, a cucumber and eggplant, beans, peas, cabbage, or broccoli. Those are very general rules. The chart that I mentioned just a few minutes ago will give you much more specific information. And what it will, you will have, um, the other way you can think about it is the depth of the soil in the pot. You're creating a, a, a place to hold a root system. Root systems want to go to different depths. So if you consider how much room down a plant is going to have to put out a root system, it gives you another measure of what will grow in that pot. If you have a container that has four to six, that is four to six inches deep, you can grow salad greens, Asian greens, mustards, garlic, radish, and herbs like basil, cilantro, thyme, mint, and marjoram. If you have a pot that's eight to 12 inches deep, and then these are minimums, you can grow bush beans, beets, chard, carrots, peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, and then rosemary, parsley, lavender, and fennel. Again, those are minimums. And if you can give the, if you can give the plant greater depth, the plant will do better. It'll, it'll be easier to keep that plant watered because it'll be more medium to hold the water. But keep in mind always that you are going to be much better off growing a variety of a plant that is smaller than a full-size plant. Look for varieties that are labeled bush, as in bush beans, dwarf, patio, as in patio tomatoes, toy, as in toy choy versus full-size bok choy, or mini. How do you know which varieties are better? It's not that hard to figure that out. Look for those, those descriptors, but also look in, say, the Burpee catalog or the Harris Seeds catalog, and, and where they have their own search bar at the top saying, what are you looking for? Put in vegetables for containers, and they will give you a whole list of varieties that work better in containers than some of the larger plants that they offer. Also, when you go to a store or to a nursery to buy a plant, Look on the label, a lot of them these days have information on them to indicate whether or not they're suitable for growing in containers. But in general, a patio tomato or a cherry tomato is gonna to be more successful in a pot and give you more of a yield for all the work you're going to put in than a standard sized tomato. Same is true with you know smaller, smaller versions of beans, smaller versions of peppers, smaller versions of just about anything, will give you more success. There are certain vegetables that are not really suited to growing in containers at all uh, because the root systems are too big. Uh, 
vining plants like melons and pumpkins, especially the larger ones, are very difficult to do in pots because they really like to have re big root systems. And also because the vines themselves get so large, they can literally drag the pot across the ground as they grow. So you want to be careful. Um, maybe if this is your first time doing this, you, this is something you would not want to attempt. Um, but just remember, in general, more space in the pot is always better, regardless of what you're growing. Um, someone asked me also, this just popped into my head, uh, do you need to weight the bottom of the pot that you're using outside? The only, you do not have to put stones or any kind of drainage in the bottom of the pot for the sake of the root system. That's not necessary. The only reason you might want to think about that is if you are concerned that the pot may blow over in the wind or get knocked over by somebody walking past it. In order to handle that problem, you can put weight in the bottom of the pot underneath the soil. Your other option is to take some sort of garden stake that fits through one of the drainage holes in the bottom of the pot and actually put the stake in the ground or tie the pot to a deck rail or something like that. Um, but it's just, the problem there is tipping, uh, not drainage, so you don't need to worry too much about putting weight in the bottom of the pot. The other uh, issue you need to be aware of is if you want to put vegetable pot, all vegetable pots have to have holes in the bottom. You know, I'm sure you all know that. They have to be able to drain. You're going to be putting chemicals in that pot to, when you fertilize it. And under certain circumstances, those fertilizers and those chemicals that come out of the bottom of the pot with the drain water can stain your deck or stain your patio. So if you're concerned about that, you need to either put the pot somewhere else or figure out some kind of covering for the pet deck or patio that will prevent the water from staining the surface that it's sitting on. That's about everything that I have to say today. There is I'm sure you realize thousands of more words that can be said on growing vegetables in containers. So I urge you to do further reading. I urge you to look up um, growing specific vegetables that you're interested in and getting to know what is best for each one. Uh, you will have much more success if you are more knowledgeable about what it is you want to grow. Is there anything other question I can answer at the moment? Linda, that was fantastic. That's a lot of information and there's a ton of questions in here. Um, I think we could teach for the rest of the day probably, but <laughs> we have a couple minutes. So um, one of the, uh, two of the questions that came up were um, reusing the soil at the end of the season or mid season. Can you refresh it? Do you have to get rid of the soil at the end of the season um, to overwinter? Um, and then can, when you talk about pot size, can you put more than one vegetable in a pot? Ah, yes, that was something I forgot to mention. Um, some of you are probably familiar with succession planting, with starting with lettuces or radishes or something uh, in your tomato garden early in the season, and then by the time that they're done, the tomato has grown up and is taking the rest of the space. You can do the same thing in a pot. You have to be a little more circumspect about how much you expect that pot to do. But it is possible, especially if you're putting small tomato plants, small pepper plants, uh, things like that, small cucumbers into a pot at the beginning of the season. You can also put lettuces, radishes, scallions, something that's going to be ready long before the, the tomato or the cucumber is expected to really ramp up production. And, you, and then when the lettuce is done or the radishes are picked, you just leave it. Uh, you just leave the pot for the, the main crop. Um, as far as reusing the soil, I'm not sure I understood the question, but if you're, if you're planting something that is uh, like asparagus, that is a perennial and will grow from year to year and you want to keep it in a pot, you're going to have a hard time getting that plant through the winter unless you put it in the ground for the winter. If you're talking about annual vegetable plants, um, I would not expect that you, don't expect that you could use that soil again next year without amending it considerably. And what I, if you really want to do that, that, so, that soil is going to be pretty much exhausted. But if you wanted to split it, say, two ways or three ways, depending on the volume of the pot, at, 
and add it to new medium that you are creating or that you have bought, then you could probably get away with that. But I wouldn't expect that there would be much left in that soil without considerable remediation, more fertilizer, more vermiculite. You know, you basically have to start again. You're really asking that soil to work extremely hard. Linda, do you recommend storing the pots inside over the winter or are they safe just sort of in the spot that they were and then people can tend to them in the spring? Well, that to an extent depends on the material. Some pots, plastic pots, you can store outside with no problem. Not, nothing's going to happen to them. Um, if you want to just pull the plants out, you know, and leave the soil there, you can do that. Um, and, or you can stick them in a shed or, or behind your shed or something. There are certain materials, especially ceramic materials, that will crack when they freeze. So you have to be careful about those. You may have, you have to identify those and bring them inside if you want them to last through the winter. Um, but most plastic, some plastic pots will also crack when they freeze. So you just have to be aware of what material you're using and what will happen to it. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and then I think the last question we can have time to go through is people were a little concerned about using bleach um, and its effect maybe on their lawn or septic system. Can you use vinegar instead or are there any alternatives to bleach? Well, I don't honestly know the answer to that. Bleach is the most common disinfectant that's used. I know you can buy horticultural vinegar that, to kill plants. I would imagine you might be able to use that also, but I would have to research that. Um, why don't you let me take a look at that and see if I can come up with other ideas and then I'll send them to you, Melissa, and you know, maybe you can put them on a notice board or something. Or sure, um, I can do that. Somehow, the, I, don't, I, I don't know the answer right now, but uh, let me look into that and see if there is an alternative to bleach. I know bleach is a little tough to work with, especially the, for people who are sensitive to it. What was the dilution of the bleach? Was it one part bleach to how much water? Or are you just Nine parts water, one part bleach. So if it's, it's either nine cups to one cup or nine quarts to one quart or nine gallons to one gallon. I used gallons in my example because I'm accustomed to working with larger pots and that's just the, you can order to get the volume of the solution that you need to accommodate the pots, you need more. But Great. do whatever you need to do. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Linda. We appreciate it. I think everybody really learned a lot. I know I did. I'm a terrible container gardener. I fail every year. So hopefully um, I can start again. I know some people were saying, you know, when should I get started? Um, I think container gardening timeline is pretty much the same thing as gardening in the ground where there are plants that are um, acceptable or, or what should I say, do not get damaged by frost so that can kind of get started right now. And then there are plants that are really frost sensitive, like your basils and tomatoes and things, and those should wait till uh, mid to late May. Yes, that's true. Okay, great. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna save this chat and all the questions that we didn't have time to get to. We have the recording, we have all the sources that Linda mentioned, including the uh, Rutgers hotline and how you can reach out to them. So we'll be emailing everybody that- yeah, the hotline is, yeah, it's not open now, but if it reopens, I'll let you know. Right, but the link that they can type in those questions, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yep. Okay. So thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, Linda, for all the information. And we hope everybody has a great day. You Take too. care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.